All right. Uh, how many of you here are aware of the third party cookies? Okay, then this talk is all for you. <laughs> and uh, so, okay, I'll just announce the next speaker. Um, you've already seen the name, Alberto, and Alberto is right there. So, uh, Alberto has been a part of the develop developers uh, relations engineer team. Uh, and uh, currently working on the privacy sandbox initiative at Google. So I'd like you all to give a huge round of applause for Alberto. Thank you so much for being here. And over to you, Alberto. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hello, hello. Oh, yeah. So I'm glad that I saw many hands up. So by now you know that um, all major browsers are moving in the direction of um, you know, ma making the web platform more private in many ways. That includes deprecating third-party cookies. And if you are a developer, a site owner, or you know, as a technology leader, our goal is to take action and get ready so that our sites and our web properties are ready for the, this major transition and then we um, guarantee that our users experience the minimum amount of disruptions. So in this session, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a very quick overview of everything that you need to know so to understand what's changing and what actions that you have to take to get ready. So let's start with the root of the problem. So, Composability is one of the superpowers of the web, right? So nowadays, nobody builds a site from scratch, right? Back in the day when you were little and I was starting working on the web, actually every web developer de developed the site from, from, from scratch, you know, from zero to complete. You know, nowadays, actually, there are so, ma so many third-party components that we put together to bring the user experience to our user. And this is a model that is been very, very powerful because we don't have to do all the work ourselves. But there is a big problem with this is that this um, composability of third-party components make the user very vulnerable when it comes to privacy and protecting their data. So, and the core of the problem is that the web was built on top of technologies that were designed a long time ago, and they were not designed with privacy in mind. You know, at, that, at that time, the important thing was to get the thing working, and we were so excited that everything was working, and for many years, the situation stayed like that. Um, and despite of the severe uh, privacy vulnerabilities, the, these technologies, oh, sorry, I wanted to dive a little bit more on this. So, so when I say technologies that were not privacy preserving, I'm talking about two things. One is the use of unpartition storage, right? This ability that we have to store data in the browser of a user and then access it when the user goes between sites. You know, that's what is called unpartition storage. And the other one, that I'm referring to is cover tracking. No? So it's like these techniques that take advantage of data that the browser exchange between the server and the client to basically determine and uniquely identify you as a user as you navigate through the web. Right? So these two things are very powerful. And despite of the vulnerabilities that they present, they have basically been, uh, has enabled us to power the web as we know it today. today. Like for example, the, you know, personalization, like having the ability to log in once and not having to log in many times, uh, having the ability to your images to be loaded faster for a CDN, all these capabilities that we are so used to are powered by these privacy-poor technologies, right? And this situation was, has been this way for the last 20 plus years. And for, for many years, the users just didn't know about it. And also, even when we knew about it, we just say, well, we know what are we going to do? So we want to take advantage of the web, and the web is awesome, then, okay, track me. I don't care, right? But the, the thing has been changing quite a bit recently. You know, in recent surveys, it has been, you know, it, it's clear that more than 80% of the of users out there de are demanding user privacy, that they have been se severe scandals that have been user, uh, made users aware of the problem. And it is estimated that by 2024, by this year, more than 75% of the world population is going to be under some kind of regulation that controls what can be tracked and what cannot be tracked. Right? And in response to this demand and this pressure from the government, then businesses are moving in the direction or actually making their technologies or their solutions more privately preserving. Right? And the good thing is that as I said at the beginning, we didn't have the technologies that allowed us to be privacy preserving, but now the technologies are here, they are very strong, so the time is right to do this. You know? Now, um, as I said at the beginning, all browsers are moving in this direction. You know, Safari was one of the first that started with something that is called intelligent tracking protection, then Firefox followed with enhanced tracking protection, something like that. And Chrome has been working on this for the last few years. Edge announced recently that they are also going in the same direction. 
Um, and when it comes to, to Chrome, Chrome has been investing a lot in making the platform as safe and secure as possible. And that includes a variety of features. It's not only cookies. For example, if you, use, if you are a Chrome user, you are now you know, taking advantage of the strong password manager that does a lot of work for you, so that ensuring that you don't have weak password, that your, if your password has been compromised, the Chrome tells you, and so on. You can force all your connection to go through HTTPS, and you name it, right? And the focus of today's talk is an initiative that is called Privacy Sandbox, that has um, the goal of, it's actually an industry-wide, uh, it's not only Chrome, not only Google, that has the purpose of trying to remove the problems that make the web platform privacy weak, and also, at the same time, bring forward building blocks that allows us to implement technologies that have, until now have been powered with cookies and on partition storage on top of privacy-preserving building blocks so that the web remains vibrant and private at the same time. Um, now, at the core of the problem of the privacy vulnerability of the web is this idea of how do we determine our identity on the web, right? So on the web identity, is based, uh, you see, this is like the format shot shifted there a little bit, but web identity today is determined by a confluence of two factors. One is this ability that we have to store data in the uh, user's browser on every time that the user goes to a site, we, the, the server is able to put some information there. And that information can be shared across site boundaries, right? So putting those, th those two things together, what happens is that as you browse the web from side to side, these cookies allow third-party providers to build a global profile of you as a user. So you know, they know that Alberto likes sports, he has a dog, he went to the bank, he went to the pharmacy, and that is the problem, right? Because they, in principle, they do that to serve you things that you want, like, you know, personalization or relevant ad, but also they, you, you know, they are taking information from you that you don't want them to have. Um, now, if we want them to make the web more private, then what we need is to bring a new privacy model for the web. And then if you follow that link there, that is basically a proposal for a new privacy model that basically is based on three major principles. First, browser state has to be partitioned at the top level. So if I go to site A, I am agreeing to be tracked on site A because I'm going to site A. When you go to Facebook, you say, Facebook, I am your user. Yeah, you know what I'm doing. But you don't want whatever happens in site B to be known when you go to site B. So that's principle number one. Now, there are many use cases that are legitimate, that require or need you know, these applications to know that you went from one place to another. So we need to somehow provide those uh, capabilities to achieve that. That's going to be possible, but only via browser mediation. So the browser is going to be the arbiter that is going to involve the user. So that when that happens, the user has a say, and everything is transparent. And when information is exchanged on, on a cross-boundary, a cross-site boundary, the amount of information that is going to ex be exchanged is privacy preserving using statistical techniques, and also is very limited. It's only what is needed, no more. Okay, so now privacy sandbox then has um, you know the purpose of, of three tracks, if you, if you will. The first thing that privacy sandbox is trying to do is to remove the source of the problem. So let's try to you know if we know that on partition storage and cover tracking is the problem, let's try to remove it. Second, we cannot do just say okay, let's remove uh, cookies and on partition storage. That's it. Whatever you are doing with them is your problem. Because if we do, do, if we do that, then the web is going to doubt. Publishers are not going to be able to sustain themselves, and then this community specifically is going to be severely affected. So what the process of Bog is trying to do is, well, let's provide the building blocks so that all the applications that are powering the web today are possible, but in a privacy-preserving manner. Okay, and then you can see there that there are four categories of these uh, building blocks. Two of them have to do with private advertising, and then the third one is the one that we are going to be discussing today. It has to do with cross-site privacy boundaries. That is that idea that you, know, you are going to limit the scope of what you can do. And then also we need to count the area of fighting uh, spam and fraud. Now, at the moment, 
that you remove technological components that are used to track users, you have to be very careful. What, was, what, what could happen is that then people are going to start come up with, coming up with ideas of how they are going to track you. So another track of the privacy and bug is that we need to make sure that we combat things like bounce tracking or fingerprinting or those kind of things. So we can say, well, we're going to remove cookies and we are not going to allow you to track users in other ways. So let's make the platform truly secure. Now, if you are a Chrome user, all these privacy and bugs, you're going to experience it through a new Chrome feature that is called tracking protection. Um, Chrome is rolling out this uh, feature little by little. And if you are one of the users that has it, you're going to see an interface like this. You're going to see, you know, you're going to see a message that says, OK, now you're browsing more private. You're going to see a little eye in the URL bar with a slash there that says your, your cookies are blocked. And you are able so far to re enable. You, as a user, you say, no, 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 I want cookies. I want to be tracked. OK, re-enable them, OK? And so in order to facilitate testing, we want to do this in a way that gives you time to actually test if your sites want to work, all your use cases are taken care, and take action to fix the things that need to be fixed. So in order to achieve that, we started rolling 3PCD, third-party cookie deprecation, to 1% of all users. When I say a user, it's a Chrome instance. And we're going to be doing this until Q3 this year. So this is enough time for you to go analyze your site, see what's breaking, what's not breaking, and then do the things that, you know, you need to do to make sure that your users will not experience disruptions later. After Q3, then we are going to ramp up all the way to 100%. I don't know, I'm not, not sure how long gonna, that time is going to take, but we have until now, until Q3, to take action. So what do we need to do? And this is the purpose of this talk. Let's try to get ready for the deprecation of third-party cookies. So there are four things that we need to do, according to me. <laughs> So first, we need to understand what's happening. What is changing exactly? What is privacy sandbox exactly? Once we understand that, then we, we need to take advantage of guidance and tooling that is available to you to audit your sites, try to see what breaks, and get ready. Third, once you identify what's happening in your site, you have to say, well, if I'm using cookies for this scenario, what are the building blocks that I can use to replace what I'm doing, and then in a way that is privacy preserving? That's what I call mapping your scenarios to prices and box APIs. And the final point is just make it happen. Right? So now that you are clear, I need to do this, I need to implement that, there is no substitute. You have to roll your, all your slips and make it happen. So let's start with step number one. What's changing? So a little you know, fundamental review. The web is built on top of the hypertext transfer protocol. That is a, basically a communication protocol to exchange things between a web server and a web client, right? And um, the HTTP is a stateless protocol. So, you know, as a, as a user agent, like a browser, sends a request to the, the web server, the web server takes the resource that was asked, which could be an image, a video, a web page, and then returns it, and that's it. It forgets everything. So it's designed to be stateless. There was no state at all. As soon as 1994, they realized, no, but wait a second, this is not going to work, right? So if we want to do anything useful, we need to do some kind of state. And they borrow some mechanisms that were available in Unix at that time that were called the magic cookie. And they say, why don't take this concept from Unix and bring it to the web? And they call it web cookies. And that's where cookies were built, right? So cookies, when you think about cookie, is basically a very simple state management mechanism. You know, not different from local storage or session storage, but very simple at the core. So a cookie then is not nothing else than a key value pair. The name of the cookie and what is stored in the cookie. The rest of the cookie is a set of metadata that tells the browser how to deal with the cookie. You can say, for example, well, the domain of the cookie is a.com, which means that this cookie, in principle, can be only accessed by a.com. That that's not necessarily the case because there are you know, a bunch of edge cases that people do exploit, but that's what that means. You can also say, well, I want this cookie to be, to expire in a certain time. I want to force it to be used only over secure channels and so on. Um, the way that cookies are set, they can be set via HTTP or JavaScript. If we think about HTTP, it's just basically what I said. Every time that there is a request to the server, the server re the response comes with a set cookie header with a cookie and a value, the browser says, OK, this, brow this is the cookie with these parameters. I put it in the browser. Then on every subsequent request to the server, the browser sends the same cookie. 
So whatever is stored in the cookie outdated, then the, the server is going to keep receiving. No? And then you can start seeing how the source of the problem starts shaping. Now, cookies are super simple, and you can classify them basically in terms of what you use it for. But at the end, a cookie is a cookie, and then you know, there's nothing much to it. But for example, we can say, well, we can have session cookies or persistent cookies, you know, cookies that expire when the browser is closed or uh, cookies that remain. Or you can say, well, I want to have tracking cookies that can be used for third-party analytics or marketing or, you know, social media, like, like buttons and things like that. You can say, okay, I want to have secure cookies that I force them to be on secure channels or only on HTTP or something. And finally, we have the scope of the cookie, right? Remember the, the domain that I told you? Well, the domain of the cookie determines if the cookie is first party or third party. If this first party, if the domain of the cookie is the same as the domain of the site that you are visiting. And it's third party if it's not. Okay? Um, so, okay. And that is the focus that we are right now. So this is where the problem relies. Third party is okay. Third party cookies is what the problem comes in and then we need to deal with it. Why? Well, you know, I said this is what I said the definition, but imagine this case over there, right? So I have two sites, site A and site B, and both sites have an embed from a third party C. So when a user goes to site A, the third party C is loaded and puts a cookie in the browser. So when the user goes from site A to site B, just by a navigation, the third party C knows, oh, this is the same user that was inside A before. Now I can show that's exactly why you got to search for something, and then you go to Facebook, and you see the ad of the zoo, and you say, oh, and then my mom says, like, oh, it's, you know, I'm with Pied, and then they cover the camera, and I kind of think, no, no, it's just a cookie that is there, and then it's basically, that's what is happening, right? So now, to summarize, privacy and bug is removing the source of the problem on partition storage. N notice that cookie is one mechanism of storage. Local storage, session storage, quota, file system API, all those are storage APIs that are changing, or you know, most, most of them are already changed. And then building a bunch of privacy preserving building blocks for us. And then I'm going to give you a hint, just a couple of APIs to give you a sense of the kind of things that you're going to be doing to get your size ready. Okay? The first API is called cookies having independent state. It's like chips. You know, I didn't invent that acronym, but that is what it means. You know, so. We just reviewed this example. With the deprecation of third-party cookies, this example is not going to be possible. However, there are certain cases in which third-party cookies are used to track users on a, on a specific site. For example, you can have an analytics provider that is provided by a third party, and you want to use it to track your users in your site. That is a third-party cookie, but on a first-party context. That case is going to be enabled is you extend the definition of the cookie just by adding the partition attribute to it. At this moment, the browser knows, OK, this is a third-party cookie, but it is on a first-party context. Then it's work. So what is going to happen then is that the browser, rather than having a single cookie place or a cookie jar for all the cookies, is going to have, well, I'm going to create a cookie jar for this third party in this site. That's what I say AC there. This is the cookies for site A and third-party C. So when the, say, the user goes to site A to site B, third party C has no idea what is in the cookie jar of site A. And then we broke the chain, and the user cannot be tracked. Now, this simple API is going to allow a lot of use cases to continue working. You have a chat you know, embed content, like a YouTube embed, or you have like a chat, chat embed, or a map widget. A lot of things are going to work only by switching from third party cookies to chips. Also, payment providers, CDNs, CMS, there is a lot of applications that is very easy to fix. Okay? Now, despite the fact that we know that third-party cookies, when they are used to track users across sites, are problematic, there are a lot of use cases that are legitimate. And I said at the beginning that I just don't want to go and break the web. Right? So we need to come up with ways to enable these uh, scenarios while keeping the users safe. And this is where related website sets come into to place. The idea of related website sets is that we would like to enable the browser to determine when there is a relation between websites so that he can say, okay, uh, this 
application that belongs to this domain is requesting third-party access in this domain, but look, they are related. Therefore, it's okay, right? So that is the purpose of uh, related website sites. So for example, I could have a company that is called example, and then I have a primary site that is called example.com, but then also then I'm very successful, and then I say, well, I wanna start doing shopping, and then I open another domain that is called examplestore.com. It's a separate domain, but I own it. Right? And also I can have, for example, one site per country. And all are my sites, but they have different domains. And so I can have a CDN associated with my business, right? So I can have a video server running. All these sites belong to me, and I want to be able to share cookies between them because the user experience for my brand is going to depend on those cookies. So related website sets allows us to define this kind of thing. So it it, you know, I put there that it's the primary. So there is an notion of a primary and then subsets associated with it. There are three, three, type, three types of subsets, right? So I can have, I don't know, when I shared the slide, the formatting, that was what I was afraid of and it happened. Anyway, so there is the, the notion of primary and then you can say, well, I'm going to have a CCTLD subset that is all the size at a country level that I, that I can own. Then I can have service subset that is, for example, CDN, video server, you name it, are in that set. And then the associated subset that I can have, for example, if I sell glasses and I sell shoes on different domains, I can put them both there. And each of these sets has certain the rationale that you have to justify, certain limitations. But once you do that, basically, you know, the browser is going to know that you're going to be able to use cookies across those sites. Now, once we have defined those sets, the, you know, other browsers have, are, have implemented some kind of similar approaches, but without the concept of related website sets. In Chrome, we have the notion of a related website sets. Once you have, you have it defined, then as a developer, you have to request access. So you have an embed in one of your sites accessing cross-site data in another site that you own, and then you're going to tell Chrome, can I have access to third-party cookies here? Chrome is going to say, oh, OK, yeah, this is your site. Go ahead. I, I ask it. But you have to ask. It's not going to be automatic. Uh, for example, here I have example.a.com, example, that's p.com. <laughs> so, and I have basically, um, I know exactly this is, cor this is correct. Uh, what I'm trying to, to convey here is that I have an embed from example b.com, and then when the embed is loaded, I'm going to ask Chrome, can I store cookies here and access them? Then Chrome is going to say yes. Vice versa is true too. I can basically, from the top level side, I can request access to the information in the cookies for domain C. And then Chrome is going to say, okay, you are in the same set, you can do it. Okay, as I said, access is granted automatically. Now, there are still legitimate use cases where you need to track users, or you need third party cookies among different sites that you don't own. And here is where the storage access API with prompts come into play. So basically, it's a little bit reminiscent of GDPR, in which you are going to be able to ask the browser, hey, I have a legitimate use case. Can I store cookies here? The browser then is going to basically pop up a little prompt that is going to ask the user, listen, this embed that you are using is requesting access. Do you want to allow it? Now, the interesting thing here is that there are limit, uh, restrictions. So the user has to interact with the iframe. For example, if, if that embed is an iframe, it's not that the frame is going to request and that's it, it's going to be a prompt, like, like a push notification kind of request. No. If the user says, I want to open this video, and the video embed says, yeah, I require cookies, then the user is going to be asked, you want to access this video, you're going to have to uh, allow the cookies. And the user says, yes, because I want to see the video. Fine. Sort of like, like GDPR. Now, um, that is related website set, storage, partition, storage, storage access API, and storage access API with prompts. Now, I mentioned that cookies is only one uh, cookie, uh, one storage mechanism. Um, there are many, OK? And all of these APIs that require to st store, uh, store access and uh, store data in a browser are going to be uh, modified. For example, many of you are familiar with local storage, right? So imagine that I have a.com site there, and then I'm doing something in that iframe, in the JavaScript associated with that iframe. And then I call local storage. That basically puts a piece of information, a key value per, in the browser of the client. When the user goes to site B, 
that also has an embed of um, example.com or C, you, any third party that we imagine, the same thing. We are going to be able to go to local storage and get the key value pair that was stored when the user went to the first site. That is not possible anymore. All the storage API have been partitioned, and now this case is going to break. Right? And then we are, you know, that is actually different from cookies because cookies are being rolled out. The, the deprecation of third party cookies is happening. All storage, all storage APIs are already partitioned. So you have, if you are relying on these APIs, you already have to be that in mind. So I just put here uh, this slide to give you an idea of how many APIs have changed. Things like the file system API, for example, that is super powerful, also is partitioned now. If you go and put something in the file system associated with site A, you cannot recover it when you go to site B. Now, in our getting ready path, we already, uh, OK, let's, you know, we know quite a bit of prices and bulk right now. We understand at a good level what is changing and what are the things that I have available for me to take action. The second part, then, is leverage tooling and guidance that is out there. And when I talk to tooling, I'm, um, about tooling, I'm referring to three things. One is Chrome, the browser, because a lot of the APIs, you can basically experience them through configuration settings of Chrome. So you're going to see, you go to Chrome settings, and you're going to see tracking protection. And then you're going to see features of the API surface to you so you can play with them, and you can configure exactly what you want them to do. The second thing is Chrome DevTools. If you are a developer, you are very familiar with Chrome DevTools. It's a debugging powerhouse that gives you all capabilities to debug anything you do with web development, CSS, JavaScript, performance, you name it. Um, and then, you know, there are many things that, many features that DevTools give you that allow you to deal with things that have to do with the particle cookie deprecation. But we wanted to build a Chrome DevTools extension on top of this tool that add extra capabilities that are not in the tool yet, and also provides you a single entry point that you, allows you to start doing your debugging and your site analysis, thinking about privacy and box, rather than in the tool as a whole that is very complicated. And that is what we call the privacy and box analysis extension. This is a, the, uh, a tool that my team is working. I'm working with uh, uh, Articam that probably many of you uh, know. Uh, we have been working in this for like a last year, and it's coming pretty good. And uh, this is what I want to talk next. So right now, the, the tool is still in pre-release. We are in 0.5.2. Uh, we have about 6,400 6, users. So, and that is basically something that the Chrome Web Store gives you that allows you to see where the, 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 the extension is used. And basically, if you want to install it, you just go to the Chrome Web Store, and then you look for prices and bugs. And then the last one there, or PSAT, you can also search for PSAT. And then that's what, you, what you're going to see. And you, when you click Add to Chrome, then that little you know, the extension icon is going to appear there with a glimpse or a, a brief summary of the cookies that are set by that page. Now, if you, go to, if you open the DevTools, and then you're going to have a privacy sandbox panel. And this is the landing page of the extension. right? So you have there an embed with the privacy sandbox site that you can start reading if you want, or you can jump to the site directly. There we put some quick links and latest information that we source from directly from their, those sites. And here on the right, on the left side, you have a panel with like privacy and box with four categories, and then you have facilitated testing. That is what I said at the beginning with the timeline. There you find information on what's happening right now, how you can request more time if you need it, and so on. I'm not going to get into details about that, but you, you can ask me if you want later. And then you have some settings there for the tool. Here you can see there are four categories, right? So we wanted to do this tool to actually not only help you with the deprecation of third-party cookies and analyzing your site, but also as we move forward, also to help with the adoption of the new APIs. However, the priority right now is to help you to understand what's happening with cookies, because that is the most important problem that you have to solve immediately. OK, so that way we have cookies, site boundaries that include chips and related website sets. And then you have private advertising that includes things like topics and protected audiences and then tracking protection that includes things like bounce tracking, fingerprinting, and so on. Now, let's focus on cookies now. If you go to the cookies panel, the first thing that you're going to see is a cookies insights page that is going to give you, at a glance, the situation with the page that is loaded in the browser at that time. Right? So here you see, for example, these are the cookies that are loaded. These are the types. And then if you expand the view there, it tells you the classification of the cookies, what the cookies are used for, 
the ones that we can figure out because we are using a database and it's not 100% accurate, but it's pretty good. And then here, the second section is very important because it tells you how many cookies were blocked in this page and why. And this is where your journey begins. Okay? You're going to say, okay, all these cookies belong to critical user journeys in my site that are potentially breaking because the browser is blocking them. Okay? And again, if you expand the view there, you're going to see the explanation of the blocking. Now, if you go to the cookies, you know, the cookies here, you have basically what is called browsing context, or you can also associate them with frames on the page, components on the page. And here you can see, for example, for the first or the top frame, that is the whole page, you can see all the cookies. And the ones that I highlighted in yellow are the ones that we identify as being blocked. The little arrow on the left tells you if the cookie was blocked on all the responses, on all the requests, or some responses, or some requests. Because then you can start analyzing and saying, OK, this cookie is actually blocked only in certain contexts. OK, let me see what's going on. If I click on one of them, you can see that the information card here tells me this, block was, uh, this cookie was blocked because of the reason of preparing for phasing out. This is a, a reason that Chrome is telling you that, listen, this is happening. I'm blocking this cookie. Take action. This cookie is just going to disappear in the future, and you will not, you know, you're not going to have an idea. And then here is a detailed explanation. Here it says, for example, if you have a cookie that has same site equal known, that it actually is a specification that tells Chrome that you want that cookie to be used in third-party context, but you don't have the partition attribute in it, then that cookie is being blocked. So now you have a lot of ideas. You say, OK, look at that. This cookie belongs to DoubleClick, which is an ad-related stuff, or to Bing, which we know is a search kind of related analytics that is something from Bing is in my page that has a cookie that is being blocked. Now you have a focus on where to look for. Okay. Now, something that the tool has that is, is interesting, that is super simple, but has been very, very useful, is filtering. You can open a filter there, and you can say, show me all the third-party cookies that have the same site attribute equal to none. And then when you do that, we're going to filter it for you, and then you can focus your attention. Or give me all the cookies for the particular third-party provider. I want to see what's happening with my analytics provider, for example. OK? Now, uh, we also implemented a feature that is very cool that is called frame overlays that, you know, if you click on that little icon over there next to cookies, what happens is when you hover over the frame of your page, this ad is going to tell you, well, this frame has these cookies. Here, for example, we have four third-party cookies, out of which four were blocked, and it's going to tell you the frame associated with this page component. This is very important because if you are trying to determine if a specific critical user journey breaks, you can go and say, this is the embed that I want to check. I hover over it. I see what is the frame. See what are the cookies that are blocked. Boom. Okay? That is, is, um, is in, some, in many cases, it doesn't work as smooth because people do all kinds of things that you can imagine, embed, inside embed, inside embed, and then the feature gets a little bit crazy. But in general, it gives you good information. Last. We implemented a feature that actually we are implementing this progressively. We are trying to um, detect things that we know that break. For example, the Google Sign In library, version number two, was known to break with, with third party cookies blocked. And they fix it. But the problem that they are having is that people are not migrating. Sounds familiar? Yes. So people don't migrate. So then what we are doing is basically we put, if you go to LinkedIn, for example, it turns out that they had that library. So here you can see non breakages. The tool detected that Google Sign In VR2 is being used. And then if you open here, it tells you, listen, you are using this functionality that is being deprecated. Please check this information to migrate. Right? So that is where and we are adding, you know, there were some problems with Facebook like buttons, with Facebook comments, with this code chat. All that we are basically putting in this ad so that people can say, okay, these things that are known to break. We know. And those are the most reference blocks that we are receiving at Google for people testing. Now, the last part is um, mapping your CUJs to the new APIs. I'm not going to go in too much detail here, but um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to point that way. So as I said at the beginning, cookies are used for whatever. It's a simple state management mechanism. So 
anything under the sun can be powered by a cookie. Things like embedded content, federation, federated identity, remote resources, comments, personalization, you name it. You know, a lot of things can be. So now, your particular site has your particular critical user journey. So you have to go and say, what is my site doing? Oh, I have a video embed. OK, I have to check this one. Oh, I have a federated identity widget here that helps me to keep my users logged in. Then you can focus on one CUJ at a time. And in general, the kind of things that you ask is, OK, well, imagine that you revert the equation. And you say, let me start thinking about the cookies. I know that these cookies are mine, right? So I'm going to ask, OK, these cookies are used to track things, users, or whatever, on the context of a specific site. OK, I want to know what my user does when it comes to this site. Then this is a third-party cookie on a first-party context. Then I can use chips easily. And now once you determine that, you go and you put the attribute partition, you're done. Right? Alternatively, you can also use local storage partition as well. That would work. Now, if the cookies that you are analyzing and use for federated identity or for single sign-on, then you can consider something like Fed FedCM that is a new solution also by Google that allows you to do this without cookies. Now, again, we saw this. Oh, I am using these cookies. And these cookies are for a uh, perfect. Um, a small number of sites that I own. Therefore, I'm OK. I can use related website sets. And I know that I need to use the storage access API. Once I have the set defined, I need to request access. Now, this kind of analysis is what I would like you to take with you and then go to your site and do it. This is a little mapping here, you know, a chat widget. Most of the time can be solved with chips. Map embed with chips, you know, you can take a picture of that if you want or see it later. And there is a lot of documentation about this, by the way, that you can take advantage of. What next? Now we saw, we now we understand what Prices and Box is, what's changing, you know, what kind of things uh, we need to pay attention to. We have an idea of the tooling that is, you know, we, we know that we need to familiarize ourselves with the features in Chrome, DevTools, and PSAT, right? We know a little bit of the kind of mapping from the, the, the critical user journeys in my site to the solutions that I need. Then fourth step is that I want you to commit today, after today, you say, I'm going to make this happen. If you are a site owner, if you are a technology leader, if anything depends on your decision power, make the decision today of go and update your site, and then you're going to be done with it. OK? Um, this is a lot of, you know, what I would like you to do is while you go, there is a lot of documentation. You set up an environment to test when you guarantee that the browser that you are using has all these APIs available to you and cookies are fully blocked. Then you're going to use DevTool and PSAT to analyze what's happening. Then you're going to audit your site fully. You're going to engage with us. There are support forums that you can reach out to us. You can, Articam and Google are working together on this. You have full support from us. And there is also, by the way, not only PSAT support forums. There are many support forums that Google has put there in GitHub and other places that you can leverage. If you find breakages that have not been solved before, please report them so that you can help the community. Um, and then if you are the owner of a big publishing site or if you are an agency working with a big site and you determine that you need more time, there are mechanisms that are called deprecation trials that you can apply to so that Google allows you to say, OK, we are going to basically let third party cookies work for you for a specific amount of time so you have time to fix them. It's not going to be forever. It's going to be a specific time, but you can request that. And that's it. I can't believe that I made it in the time that I but sorry that I went too fast. Questions? Yeah, guys, please, questions uh, that you might have. We have time for one or two questions. Yeah, please. Yes, please. Yeah, so, so thanks, thanks a lot for the for very great talk. Um, you went into very much detail in very fast time, and <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I, still, I still process it in my brain right now. Okay, yeah. but uh, so my uh, my question is simple. I mean, uh, while, I, while I was also listening to you, I was looking a bit on the web about this initiative. I know that the other browsers they also have initiatives and so on. And I also understand that there's a lot of criticism about each different method, even the one of Apple, even the one of Google. So what is your what is your answer to that kind of thing that the developers probably have to adapt to multiple? Uh, 
privacy yeah. solutions in the future, and especially the Google One privacy sandbox seems to be very extensive. So what do you think, uh, would there be a better way maybe to have some common forum like the W3C or others to implement a common standard, or do you think that this will eventually become a standard? Yes. Yeah. No, that's a great question, and this is basically something that, um, last year I, I presented at WordCamp Asia uh, a talk about the future of WordPress and the creator economy, in where I talk about this issue of openness, right? And, and, and when we need to make big decisions together, right? It's one of the most difficult things in the open web, right? Because uh, the prices and bogies are a massive undertake, right? And we cannot do it alone. And actually, so much that we cannot do it alone that actually the government is involved, right? Because the government is ensuring that whatever the community uh, does does not actually cause the death of publishers, right, and advertising. This is a humongous ecosystem out there that if you remove cookies, you actually could cause severe damage. Um, now, having said that, there is clarity and consensus that privacy is a necessity, right? There is user demand, there is government oversight. So there is no other way. So we need to find solutions that actually allows us to have a privacy-preserving open web. The question is how? Right now, what Prices and Bog is doing is to bring forward a set of proposals that we think, and we are investing a lot of resources and thinking, and actually collaborating with the whole industry to see if we can find these kind of building blocks that actually make the thing work. Now, ideally, you could have an idea that says, listen, you know, this could be improved this way. That is happening. So each of these APIs is subject to change. But what, in order to answer your question, what I think is going to happen is that, yes, we are going to basically go through this period that is going to be a little bit uncomfortable. There is a lot of fear, a lot of you know, anxiety. But I think that at least on certain aspects, it's not rocket science. Actually, it's changing a cookie. It's basically changing a state management mechanism. So we can do that as in, from an engineering perspective. And the, the, the bottom line is going to be is either these APIs or some other APIs. And we are open you know, to whatever it works, right? But we need to work together and make it happen. So I think it's going to happen, but let's see. Any other questions? Any other questions, please? Yeah. OK, so um, as you mentioned that the, the, the standard of privacy sandbox is just announced, and then um, as, as you mentioned that also as that the privacy sandbox is coming to enforce um, most of the Chrome user across the web, right? So um, right now, uh, right now we, right now we are working. We saw a lot of warning uh, related to uh, privacy, and um, one thing that we are unsure of is um, what type of web, uh, of what type of third party that we are using that is not currently support the first party approach of. Uh, privacy sandbox. So, how can you um, make sure that we the thing the thing that we are the thing that is not currently support is also support the privacy sandbox? Okay, let me see if I understood the question. So, you you are hinting to the fact that we say well we have a set of building blocks that address a set of scenarios, and it could be that there are some scenarios that are not covered by any of the building blocks. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a great question, right? So what I would say is that from my perspective, luckily, everything boils down to a state management mechanism, right? So every solution that out there is using the same kind of thing, putting a piece of data, recovering, putting a piece of data, recovery. So if you solve the problem at a fundamental level, it is very likely that we're going to address most of the cases. Now, there still could be some cases in which, listen, you know, this, my use case doesn't work. There are forums that are open and people are asking things, or, or are, people are saying, for example, listen, the existing building blocks are great, but they don't cover my use case fully. For example, it could be that the, the API has some limits that are too restrictive. For example, imagine that I say, uh, I want to allow you only five sets in the related website sets. Yeah, but I have 100. So what I'm going to do? Oh, wait a second, let, let's, let's, okay, so probably 100 is a better limit, that kind of thing. Still, having said that, there could be a moment in which somebody comes up with an important use case and then says, yes, we are going to address it. We are basically, our goal is to ensure, and actually the ecosystem as a whole goal is to ensure that everybody comes along, right? So it's not like, you know, some other, um, 
scenarios are that people say, okay, let's deprecate cookies and just figure it out. We are trying to do less deprecate cookies, but ensure that everybody has a solution. So I hope that that answers your question, and it's a great question. I'm sorry. Uh, could you tell us more how the chips are going to improve the payments or the CDNs and other cases that you mentioned? I would say, I don't know how much they're going to improve them. They're going to improve them in the sense that they are going to be now privacy safe, right, in the same, right? But um, I would say that basically you're going to switch from using third-party cookies on a first-party context to use third-party cookies on a first-party context safely by adding the partition attribute. Um, that's what I would say. I don't see that it's going to add anything additional of what you already have, because basically the only thing that's going to happen is that you're going to continue, you're going to use cookies, but in a restricted way, in a safe way. All right. All right. I'm so sorry. Uh, we are running out of time. So, uh, so please. Last one. Just, this last question. Okay. Uh, this is a non-technical question. So non-technical question. I was curious to understand how the governments are interacting with you and how they are helping and governing. And is it just the U.S. governments, or how are the global governments engaging? Yeah. If you I, I only, usually, I want to answer the question usually like, I am not, I'm basically, I am a developer relations person working on tooling for the ecosystem. I want to give you my, my perspective. What is happening, and this is open information out there, there are regulators, like for example, the CMA, that I don't even remember what the, the you know, whatever uh, agency in, in the UK is overs overseeing a lot of the things. There is the IMDA in Singapore. There is here in Taiwan also there are, you know, a lot of oversight. And what, what is happening is basically, and Google is actually very happy that this is happening, right? Because we want to ensure that what we do is approved. It's basically there is consensus, right? So um, we don't want to go with a unilateral solution that then basically people are going to say, no, you are doing it because it benefits you. Now listen, this is and then they are very fine that each of these building blocks actually work for everybody. So we have to prove to these regulators working with the stakeholders. The stakeholders have to say, yes, this works for me or no, that doesn't work for me. And then the idea is that we're going to go on an iterative process so that at the end, the solutions that we come up with to market are going to basically be satisfactorily solving the problems for everybody. So I don't know how many regulators are involved, but I, I'm, I'm aware that the UK, the Singapore one, and others are basically you know, verifying everything. And until those regulators are not happy, this is not going to see the, lo the light of day fully, because that's the whole purpose. And they are basically doing it. I, I, I like what they are doing. I think that they are very thorough. They are very, you know, they also want this to work, but they are tough. You know, they are not basically, you know, it's very interesting, very dynamic that I had never seen, I had never been in a project like this where actually a technology trend is being defined by so many stakeholders at the same time, right? Must so it's... Must be fun working with them. Well, thank God I'm not working with them. I'm just technically here, but it's, it's very difficult because you have to basically be creating reports, you have to be very thorough, you have to be very specific, so it's kind of beautiful, you know, like, a, and for example, like, the fact that we are developing tools, I, I'm doing it because from a developer relation perspective, I believe that tooling is necessary, but that shows the regulators that actually, listen, you know, we actually are doing things for, the, for you to be able to succeed because cookies are very simple, but figuring out what's happening at across the whole level is not trivial, you know, and then, so, so thank you so much. If you have more questions, I'm going to be here tomorrow too as well, so we can talk. Thank you so much, Alberto. And uh, just a token of appreciation from our end. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. Oh, nice. Cookies. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.